You know, this morning I was thinking about how lucky I was not to have to follow John McCarthy. <laughs> because after his inspiring address, I said, wow, I may just cancel. <laughs> and then, after breathing a sigh of relief, I found out I had to follow him again. <laughs> but John is a non-architect, but a great champion of design and community planning. I really appreciate you and your work that you've done here and the help that you've given to the design community. <clears throat> Now this um, weekend, Sarasota in the 60s, is kind of all about the good old days. But the best thing about the good old days was I wasn't good and I wasn't old. <laughs> <clears throat> First, before I talk about my work, I'd like to give a shout out to John Howie, my partner in um, not really a partner, but everybody thought of him as his brother because he's such a great guy and was so good for the Sarasota County and the uh, Sarasota School of Architecture. He was one of the founders of the school as a mythical name because we didn't call it the Sarasota School back in those days. But Gene Leedy and, and John Howie came up with the idea and uh, it stuck. <clears throat> so, salute to you, John, wherever you are, maybe out in the desert with the uh, Sanderling House, the, the, <laughs> the uh, Walker Guest House, or up in space somewhere on a trip before you get to heaven. But uh, farewell, my friend. <clears throat> now, Carl said it very well about architecture. It's really a team sport, and it's all about collaboration. <clears throat> and besides the, the design team, architects and engineers, there's a construction team, subs, general. There's the, con the client, and the client, of course, is the most important part of this because without a client, you have no building, you have nothing. And um, I think that uh, in looking back, I've been writing a book and it's going to be out in the spring and look for it on your Amazon site or Barnes & Noble or, or the Sarasota Architectural Foundation site. <clears throat> and it'll be ready probably in April or May. But I was born in, in Philadelphia, moved to Virginia as a baby. Spent most of my early life there in Virginia Beach and then Charlottesville, going to the University of Virginia for two degrees. And um, finally got into architecture after I had graduated the first time and been in the Army <clears throat> and had a small family. Among the family is Francis, my daughter, Fran, who is an architect, also went to the University of Virginia and uh, now lives in London. She was a partner in a firm in the Isle of Guernsey for many years till her husband's business banking took him to London. So they've lived in London ever since, um, except for seven lovely years in New York and Central Park South, which was just such a delight for us to be able to visit the great city with our great family. Um, Fran may interrupt me or, or chime in because she has, like John McCarthy, she has memories of growing up in Sarasota, in the architecture, running around on our construction sites and that sort of thing. When you think of collaboration, you think of patronage. Somebody mentioned that. And the, a great client is a great patron or sponsor. They're more than just the person that gives you the money to design and build their house. 
And I was so fortunate in the days in the early 60s, I opened my firm in 1961. I had come from graduation back to work for Bill Zimmerman. And not long after I got back, Bill went off on an extended sabbatical to dry out in the Bahamas with his son, Billy, and uh, left me in charge of the office. And um, here I was about 28 or nine years old. He was off in the Bahamas and I had to feed not only my family, but the first check I wrote every week was to his family, his <laughs> wife and five children. <laughs> So it was, it was quite a challenge, but I grew up real fast. And uh, I kind of think I earned my PhD there. But that brings me to the next project, and that is Plymouth Harbor, which we'll be having our closing party in. <clears throat> and I think of my PhD as Plymouth Harbor Design because that took several years out of my life and I learned a great deal from it. And, but I had a sponsor. The only reason a young guy like that got the job is because of a, a sponsor who knew more about heart and soul than he did about architecture, but we connected. And that was John Whitney McNeil, the pastor of the First Congregational Church who which still exists here and is now the United Church of Christ. <clears throat> but John's been long gone, but he was a, not only the spiritual leader of uh, the Plymouth Harbor Foundation, but he also was one of the founders of New College, which was the United Church of Christ Foundation, it was the same church that founded Harvard and Yale and Oberlin and a number of other small schools. Um, John was a, a great man and he allowed me to work into this and convince the board and the contractors that I could do the job. But talking a little bit about architecture, my first job here house that I ever completed was done in the office of, William, of Ralph and William Zimmerman. Bill had taken off for the Bahamas and introduced me to the client and said, they're all yours, Frank. And they were wonderful, Buck and Wanda Weaver from, from Chicago. And they wanted a tropical house. And even though this is not the uh, glass and block and steel and timber, house that you normally think of as a Sarasota schoolhouse, you'll notice the structural integrity, the exposed structure, the deep sheltering uh, walls, uh, roof. And this, um, this really works. And Wanda never used the air conditioning. She just opened up the windows. It was 1960 and air conditioning was just becoming standard. A lot of houses didn't have it. And from that house to this house, the big house. So I was turned loose with this by John Whitney McNeil and his board. And obviously it took a huge collaboration there. I had wonderful architects with me, working with me. Louis Schneider uh, had his own firm in Bradenton, but he was my associate and he had some experience in high rise building. And, he was about 10 years older than me. And in fact, Lewis retired and to Plymouth Harbor and lived out his last days in Plymouth Harbor. So that was kind of a nice dream. And then uh, Jim Holiday was my in-firm associate that had a lot to do with it. And probably the, one of the more brilliant designers I've ever had working with me is Jim Durden and Jim was responsible for a lot of the detail that you'll see that sets this building apart from many buildings. That's just a view from the west from St. Armand's, looking across the water. 
an interior of the dining room and the uh, public space. And this is probably the most distinguishing characteristic of Plymouth Harbor. It's a retirement center. And it, um, one of the problems that John Whitney McNeil and I had as we were thinking about and conceiving the idea behind Plymouth Harbor was how do you take people mostly from the Midwest, uh, mostly from small towns and single family, one or two story houses and put them in a, what turned out to be a 25 story building, which is still the highest in Sarasota, by the way. And um, the city uh, made a code after we built this and lowered the height restriction. Probably as a deference to me, so I'd always have the highest building. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, Ken Thompson was the city manager at the time, and one of the other parts of collaboration is the government. The, uh, the authority that grants permission for zoning and planning and transportation and, and uh, construction. So Ken was our wonderful city manager for over 30 years, and he probably has as much to do with putting it, the building, the town on the map as anybody else. John, you need to conclude Ken in your <laughs> next presentation. So the solution to the idea of, of non-card or non-institutional building, large building, was to put what we call colonies in the uh, center of the building. So there's a core, and each three floors has a, uh, has a, a colony or lounge space that opens up to, a, to another lounge and kitchen on the, uh, the Gulf side. So everybody, even if you're on the other side of the building, you have a view of the Gulf by coming into your colony. And they organize clubs, bridge clubs, garden clubs, um, and uh, social clubs uh, as colonies. And there were no more than 40 units in each colony, mostly less than that. So there's always a debate about whose idea the colony was, because it's the best idea in the building. <laughs> but I think it's really John Whitney McNeil's idea. He had gone to the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver, some of you might know it still exists. And this was about an eight-story building with a fairly intimate colony or an atrium, as opposed to the atrium in the Hyatt Regency in Atlanta, which is out of scale. So John brought this idea and we were able to put it together and make this kind of a building. The next building came from the next patron, who I was very fortunate to work with, and that's Mary Hook, Mary Rockwell Hook from Kansas City, and she was one of the first women architects in the state of Kansas. I think she was the first registered architect in Kansas. A wonderful woman, five feet tall on a good day, and had a husband named Ing Ingram who uh, served her every purpose and every need. And as an architect, she had done some distinguished work back in Kansas and other parts of the country, but she was semi-retired -ret then. She had developed Sandy Hook, which some of you have seen on tours, and you'll get a glimpse of uh, on the Siesta Key tour today. And she and I became friends because she liked to look invite architects over, and actually a number of architects, Rudolph and Victor Lundy and uh, the Zimmermans and uh, Joe, did you do a house there? But she, she liked the collection of architects, and we did several houses in there, most of them by Jim Holiday, who worked for me and was an associate at the time. So Mary said, what's your next gig after Plymouth Harbor? Because it was under construction and going up and she could look out from her balcony and see Plymouth Harbor in the distance. I said, well, I really want to do cluster housing. I had 
studied this in, in college, and I had William H. White as one of my visiting professors, and uh, uh, other people who were involved in urban design, and really my interest was more urban design than single buildings, and how it relates to the community. And she had this wonderful site only a quarter of a mile from the village and all the services, walkable distance, uh, what we now call new urbanism would fit very well in this community. And so Mary looked next door and said, well, I own a little property next door. It was about nine acres, fronting right on a little beach, a little cove on Big Pass. And she said, how'd you like to develop that? And I said, oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, she made it possible by selling it in two pieces, two parcels, at a very reasonable price. So we were able to keep the density at about a, less than half of what it was allowed to be under the zoning code. And um, this occupied my life for quite a while. In fact, when we started in the mid-60s, Fran was about, about 12 years old. Oh, the mid-60s. No, I was, I was much younger than that. I was 9 or 10 or something. Speak up, friend. Can tell you hear about, me? Tell, <laughs> tell, about, tell about living in Sandy Cove as it was developing. Thanks, Dad. I just wanted to say that um, it's really kind of him to invite me to be here and to speak on behalf of living under the same roof as Frank Folsom Smith and growing up as his child. And, uh, He's as great as he seems. <laughs> and I know he's he's you paid him a lot for that. <laughs> he paid him a lot. But we spent a lot of our youth and a lot of our childhood um, on architectural sites and construction sites and in the office and waiting for daddy to finish a telephone call or a sketch or or a meeting before we could get to school or get to ballet class, or whatever it was. But he gave us um, such an insight into all the things that the previous speakers have been telling us about, and you about, and I just um, lived it as his child. And for an example, at Sandy Cove, when we moved there, we, um, it was the greatest playground in the world. Mrs. Hook, was very elderly by those days, and she would come, and um, Daddy and her would have a drink and talk about the site, and we were there as children because we were always together. We'd play on the beach, and we would, um, there was a great big lake that you'll see in this picture, well, maybe the one before, um, and it was dug, and it was very, very deep, and all the children in the neighborhood would come and play and make forts in the lake before they filled it with water. And I met many people that way and became friendly with the locals. So we had a lot of fun and um, everybody in our family participated. As the buildings went up, um, sometimes um, we had to give tours for visiting people who were interested to look at it. And um, we children would actually conduct tours as well. <laughs> Everybody was involved. Some teenagers. We were. But it was, we lived the life. And the one thing I do want to mention and pass on to Dad, because one of the threads that goes through all of his work and is very topical at the moment now, is um, what we call sustainability. In those days we called ecology and that movement of um, working with the land that's been brought up. And uh, that is something that Dad's work from the very beginning stages has always counted as a, as a huge, um, important you know, line. And we would have parties there and uh, I just wanted you to know that his, his work, as you'll see throughout this exhibition, 
of work in, in the exhibition next door, you'll see that, that, that care and concern for the environment, which I want you to bear in mind as you go through. This picture was taken from the terrace of a five-story building which we, uh, we lived in after uh, the family moved back to Virginia during Fran college years and my daughter Laura's college years. And that house that's cantilevered out, the balcony cantilevered out over the lake is where Mary Hook and Ingram retired <laughs> at the age of about 90. And uh, she lived out her life. So my sponsor liked what we did apparently because she came and, and bought a place right on the lake. That was a, the greatest compliment you can get from a client sponsor. This is that uh, penthouse where we lived on top of the uh, space and um, I don't see her in the audience. I thought my wife Anne, Anne Folsom Smith, interior design, oh, back in the back. Hi. And, and we lived there for a number of years until we found our 100-year-old dream house on Sarasota Bay, which we've been in ever since. By the way, also with, with Anne is my granddaughter from another child, Summer Smith. And somewhere in the room, you've got a long, ganky, lanky photographer who's Fran's son, William. <laughs> and, and so William's from London, but he also lives in LA now. So we get around the Smiths now. <laughs> well, there were other projects, and I could go into a lot. You can go see the exhibit and see them. This is just an aerial view of the, all of the Sandy Cove, including the property next door that I bought on the right going up the line. And we, we continued the project, so we ended up with 113 units. This is the terrace, it's just down the beach, less than a half mile from Sandy Cove. And it was for another client, I wouldn't call him a sponsor, but a, a neat guy who had um, acquired the property and built that little building thinking he was gonna do low rise, pre-stressed concrete stuff. And I said, you've got the best site on Siesta Key. It's right on the point where the, the pass comes into the Gulf. So we thought we'd go high rise and we ended up going 17 floors. And then the county changed the zoning <laughs> to 13 floors. So we have the tallest building in the county also. <laughs> Something I do to governments. And that's a rendering, but that's almost exactly like the building is. Now you can see in that, um, that Aerial perspective on the right, you can see the building looks just like that. And this is another, I took this one from a boat on, on the left. But there's something I want to point out. As somebody else had to point out to me, you see those shadows there dangling from the ceiling? Yes. They are really space pods. With little green men and women in them, <laughs> because there is something called sacred geometry, and they're hanging from the mothership up above. You can't see it. <laughs> and sacred geometry is something that you may have read about in England and other countries. We don't talk about it much here. But if you look at, I showed you three buildings. There's the terrace. There is the Sandy Cove penthouse right there. And there's Plymouth Harbor. It's a direct line. And I've got a book on sacred geometry and I'm gonna do some research on that <laughs> before I finish my book because I never knew this. Somebody else pointed out to me. But it showed up on this slide. And if you carry that further 
that line to the shore of, of Indian Beach, it hits very, right between my house and New College. And I did, also did a major master plan in, in 2006 for, for New College. And so I think if you continue to hit the Galapagos, which is one of my favorite places. <laughs> and if you go north, um, I mean, south if you continue. If you go north, I think it hits Bermuda, which is where my mother grew up. So there's got to be a line there or something. Something's there. And we'll ask those little guys in the space pods if maybe they can help me. Now I have a few other projects to show you. That happens to be an interior of the terrace. And those of you who are going on the Siesta Ski tour will see a, an amazing uh, restoration and, and uh, repurposing of one of the, in fact, two of the apartments on upper floors by Alphonse and Pichette a super young firm, and I want to give a shout out to the young architects. You know, we've been around a long time, Joe and Carl and me and a number, a number of others, fewer than I'd like to think about that are still surviving from the early days. But that, he did just a fantastic interior that uh, I can't describe, and because it's his, I didn't put uh, slides up, but You'll see it is. It also shows the sustainability of a building, in that you've got open spaces, broad spans. This has flat slabs that are 24 foot on a 24 foot grid. They said it couldn't be done, but we had an engineer named Bill McGraw from Tampa who said, "Oh, we can do that." They sag a little bit. <laughs> If you drop a marble, you know where the middle of the span is. <laughs> and, um, but the building works fine and many people have redone it. Now that's, uh, that happens to be Fran's granddaughter, my great granddaughter, Iris, who was here last fall. And you see the building has shutters on it because of the hurricane season. But Iris was a year and a half old. <laughs> And she was much more perfect than the uh, building itself. <laughs> this is uh, my first building downtown. I was at, I was at the Plaza Restaurant, which uh, was shown earlier, the hangout for the artists and writers and some of us poor architects who could scrape together $2 for an expensive lunch and a couple of martinis. <laughs> And this is the lawyer's professional building where the day I told Bill Zerman I was, when he returned from his sabbatical that I was gonna open my own office, he, um, he said, I'm sorry, but we parted friends and somebody walked up to me as I was leaving and, and I, Dick Nelson, a, a well-known attorney, and said, I need you to build a building for me. So that was another stroke of fortune. And, and this is the corner of the building. You can see the sunshades. This is a shameless um, derivation from Rudolph's work, but they, they worked well because they building glass faced east and west. Right next door to it was the, another lawyer's building for my friend Bill Merrill. And I heard Merrill call us 10. And it was a cool building that cantilevered the first, the second floor all the way to the property line with driveways on either side so that you could uh, get back to parking. The most significant thing in that is my 57 Speedster. <laughs> <laughs> It's next to my children, I love most of all. <laughs> I had my brick.
brick phase, but maybe the Virginia blood kept creeping in. And this is a building down on uh, Osprey Avenue near the hospital, the Wyndham Medical Building. It's since gotten a new hat, which I don't like at all. Carl knows about those kind of additions. And there's a, but it still exists and it's a medical space and we pioneered some, some thoughts there. This is the juvenile detention facility. Carl had mentioned uh, Bert Rosemith, who to me was one of the stars of architecture here in Sarasota. He actually carried through most of Paul Rudolph's work, uh, both the Riverview and Sarasota High, I think we're, he was the project manager for, is that right, Carl? Sarasota High, he was, I don't know about Riverview. He, he was Riverview, too. And Bert was a great guy, and the two of us got along, and we used to have lunch together, and joke, and the county asked, interviewed several people for the juvenile detention facility, and they ended up tied with Bert and me, and they asked us if we would work together, and it was one of the happy things that happened in my life, because Bert was such a delight, and we had a good time doing this. And you can see we couldn't get away from Paul Rudolph. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Riverview High, High School, and, and you, um, Remember, those of you that live around here, this horrible problem of the city building a new high school and wanting to tear down Riverview, and a lot of people, including Carl, went to great lengths to try to save it, even went to New York and met with Fran and, and met with other great architects. And um, we had done work at, um, the school board had asked me to do uh, additions to the Riverview High School. And um, I called Paul and asked him if he'd like to do the design that we would carry out the working drawings and so forth. He said, no, no, thank you, Frank, go ahead and do it. I had an easy relationship with him, but not close, but I had met him. And I'm, I think he was wise because you see this, that's a solid block using the same materials, but the county had gone to this windowless classroom thing, which was a dreadful thing. We, could, we did convince them to put in slot windows, but the building is more like the uh, gymnasium building that's across the campus. And then later on, they asked us to design a, a library and um, this was a brand new structure. And I had been looking at Cistercian abbeys in, in south of France, and part of which was because <laughs> Corbu said that's what inspired him for Rome Shop and other things. And so we built this, and I never really published it or got very serious about it, but it's a, it's a good building and it worked very well. And tore it down with the rest. And we also did a, we did a plan when uh, the county or the, I guess the school board participated with a private group in um, trying to uh, save the high school. And we did a plan along with Jerry Sparkman and that uh, it kept the county plan for the, uh, the new building. And we added, uh, we kept the old building and put a breezeway in between it and a drop off and thought we had a good solution, but something happened along the way. And I think I saw Sam Holiday in here, didn't I? And, um, Sam's office um, got the project, but he was defeated by a, a very mouthy 
associate architect from, from New York, <laughs> kind of shot the whole project down. So unfortunately, we lost Riverview, but that went into saving Sarasota High School. So there was a good, at least half of a good ending. I want to circle back around to the Weaver House. It was the beginning of my practice, and I'm just showing you through the 60s, I went on and practiced 45 or 50 more years and still continue to do consulting in an occasional house. But this building, in spite of its rather Polynesian or it defines a lot of the things is the clarity of structure, the timber frame, the, uh, the roof is unit deck, so that the ceiling and the insulation, the roof are all one. It had wood shingles. It had a central fireplace and also a ventilator system so that you could open these persianas. Well, actually, they're wood jalousies. So we had a, a rhythm of wood jalousies and, and glass. And even though it had air conditioning, the weavers almost never turned it on because it was shady and breezy. This is a very late afternoon shot. Then it had a, a deck connecting the bedroom pavilion from the living pavilion. So again, it's a pod job, Joe, like your pods. So it brought me back to uh, the idea of the principles in my practice were kind of taken from the Sarasota School. We didn't call them those principles. I think Rudolph had defined them, but I probably didn't pay enough attention to that. But Vitruvius said, commodity, firmness, and delight. Well, commodity is sustainability, it's function. And that, that certainly has been on my mind since I began practicing. Firmness is structure, integrity, clarity, which almost all Sarasota, true Sarasota school buildings reflect, whether they're concrete, steel, wood, or, or whatever. And then delight is the aesthetic or the extra bonus you get of joy when you look at or live in or play with the building. It's really the thing that sets the kind of architecture we love apart from just building. Now there's one last thing. I've talked a little bit about sustainability and Fran has too and about my commitment to the environment through the uh, through the years. <coughs> Fran? Those two little girls are me and my sister. And that's my father's speedster. <laughs> and we were at what All we called of those. <laughs> those three of us. And that's what we called the long trip house. That car is parked at the Weaver house, which is the house you just saw. And that was one of the many trips in the jump seat in the back of the Porsche we took with our daddy while he was checking the site. No seat belts to top down. <laughs> Very good, Dad. <laughs> I was about five years old there. And then the next picture Daddy's going to show you, that's Frank's five-year-old great-grandson. And he's doing a project on who inspires him for International him. Inspiration Day. <laughs> and his great-grandfather, known as Pops, inspires Arthur. And you can see him preparing a project. And that's a picture of Frank a professional picture in 1960. So that's him <laughs> starting to prepare his, his project on Inspiration Day. And there he is. And he is, he's wearing a t-shirt that my father brought me in the 1970s from an architectural convention. And if you can see it, it's a phonetic spelling of the word architect. And that's on my grandson. And he's wearing a cape because he believes in Captain Planet, and he thinks his great-grandfather represents a hero as Captain Planet, which is 
my grandfather saves the planet, and he's going to hand over the torch. He's taken the torch from his great grandfather. One day he might be an architect too, but for all of you architects, and I know there's a lot in the audience, and the younger ones especially, pick up that torch of the inspiration you've seen by these incredible people in Sarasota building in one of the few places in this country that was um, at the leading edge of architecture. Keep going and uh, keep Frank in mind as you do it. Well, that concludes it, except I want to say the future is bright. We have a lot of very fine young architects and middle-aged architects in town practicing, carrying the torch, and so I feel confident things are going to be all right.